And the last uh, talk of today uh, will be given by Stephanie Werner from uh, QTech. And Stephanie will tell us about the quantum internet. Uh, thank you, Adonis, and uh, thanks everyone for, for coming, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm probably going to give a somewhat unusual talk uh, for the present audience. <laughs> It'll be very adventurous. I'm either going to make all of you very happy, or actually all of you completely unhappy. Um, so I really want to kind of talk about some actually very exciting problems kind of that arise from sort of trying to realize the quantum internet, um, which are rather computer science -y in the end. Um, and maybe at this point also in a not completely, let me call it, theoretically, theoretical stage. So I will talk towards the, towards the end and to sort of motivate them, I actually want to tell you a little bit about the sort of quantum internet efforts at QTech and of what they are we doing and what do we actually want to make in order to already sort of pose some challenges to you um, that you might solve. That would be nice. <laughs> Okay, so there will be an introduction, a general overview. Then, because I try to make you happy, I will talk about like uh, theorems and things of, of some particular problems for a while. And then I will talk about some possibly more adventurous things, which uh, I want to discuss with you in the break, if you're happy to do that. All right. um, so, you know, like this is kind of, one can make these super fancy pictures, you know, like what is a quantum internet? We want to send qubits around, between any two points on Earth. Um, but it's actually not so easy um, to make this. And we had a lot of discussion kind of about how this could possibly ever work. Um, like I said, I want to kind of explain to you the scale of the problem maybe, um, to motivate these kind of many problems. So this is a discussion session actually that um, uh, um, we had actually already some time ago, but we have them actually all the time, uh, including, for example, the experimental group of Ronald Hansen and my group, and we kind of spend the entire day discussing these problems. And uh, as the outcome of this, we actually also had a lot of discussions on what do we actually want to achieve kind of when realizing a quantum internet. Um, so I want to motivate this a little bit. And in fact, this will be maybe, maybe the first sort of problem or there is kind of a specific question um, to be solved here, which I have not solved. So maybe to kind of start with the question is, uh, I think I don't need to spend much time on this for the present audience. Of course, it's a good question to ask why do we actually want to make a quantum internet. No, I think it's pretty cool to like generate entanglement between, say, 82 points on Earth. That's kind of a nice objective. Um, but it's sort of uh, useful to think a little bit of what, what you want to do with it. And uh, of course, the most famous one is uh, QKD. So we want to kind of maybe produce keys. Um, but there's actually very many other protocols available. And I think you've actually already heard some of them kind of during this, um, this conference. And I think also for the present audience, you are quite familiar with the sort of many other tasks <coughs> that one can do with quantum communication. So one can, of course, also use quantum communication to, say, link quantum small quantum computers or to, for example, I don't know, access the quantum mainframe, meaning that, you know, you have a quantum computer in the basement. I want to access it securely um, and perform sort of blind quantum computing. Okay. So maybe the upshot of this is that all of these sort of tasks that you want to um, solve there have specific requirements. Okay? So like the network needs to deliver a kind of a specific functionality um, in order to realize these kind of objectives. And this is actually, of course, as you might not be so surprised, different for different sort of tasks that we want to solve. So maybe I want to be somewhat, um, I'm going to paint a cartoon, but I want to be precise, in fact, about what um, I will do next. And in order to do this, I want to identify actually what are the elements of a quantum internet. So what's kind of going on there? So just like on a classical internet, uh, let me distinguish, in fact, uh, conceptually like the end nodes, like basically the computer or what you use the internet with, your um, phone. Um, there might be several users of this. Uh, there might be elements uh, that are in the network that maximize infrastructure, for example, like a switch, because I don't want to have a, wire, a fiber safe from every end node to any other end node. And of course, famously, um, we want to do quantum communication over long distances. Okay? So this is the objective of a quantum repeater. So the objective of a quantum repeater is to essentially stretch the distances um, and allow qubits to travel between the end nodes over much larger distances. So, of course, different protocols might have different requirements also for what the end nodes can do. So let me maybe be specific. So maybe I just, I'm happy if these guys can just prepare and measure single qubits. 
So these are, of course, very simple. And this allows you, of course, to do some interesting things, like, for example, if you do QKD, you only want to prepare and measure single qubits. Other protocols, which I'm sure you are quite aware of, um, require you to store qubits for some period of time or to manipulate qubits, in fact, based on kind of classical messages that arrive. And some protocols may be happy if these qubits are sort of noisy, and some of them, uh, I guess the most advanced ones, sort of really require sort of fault tolerant of error corrected qubits to function. So maybe to be precise, so the point is that if one wants to realize a quantum internet, then one needs to worry about all of these different things here. And one also needs to worry about something that is actually not in this picture, namely the sort of classical control, or like how do I actually coordinate all these things which go on here. Okay. So, like I said, Ronald and I actually had a lot of discussions, also including David and actually everybody else <laughs> this day. And uh, we have debated extensively what, what the quantum internet is and what we want to do with it. And as a basis of this, we came up with some stages of development uh, that I actually want to pose a test problem to you. Um, so importantly, these stages of development, um, I'm not going to look at the repeaters at all. So it's important that there are repeaters, you know, that kind of make the qubits travel over longer distances. It's also important that the repeaters sort of support the functionality desired at the end nodes. But ultimately, if I kind of use the quantum internet, I care about what can Alice do and what can Bob do. Okay. <coughs> and of course, the end nodes and the and repeaters kind of need to fit together in order to achieve that. Okay. So we have made a fancy picture, actually. <coughs> um, and uh, I guess you know that we are sort of like here. So trusted repeater networks is the only thing, in fact, which exists right now in the real world. I'm going to say a bit more about this in a second. Um, so a trusted repeater is a, a enables a sometimes also called quantum network, but it's a, maybe not a true quantum network in the sense that it supports a single use functionality, namely I can make a key between the end nodes. Um, but I can only do that if I trust the intermediate nodes. Um, then enable me to do that. So essentially, I make a key over very short distances. Um, so I have kind of a secure key between each segment, but not over the entire line, unless, of course, I trust all these repeaters in the middle. Okay. I'll say a, bit, say a bit more about this in a second. So the first sort of non-trivial thing is what we call prepare and measure. And I want to kind of be more specific about that. <coughs> so this is very simple, in fact, and this is exactly what you might expect, that um, we will call a network a prepare and measure network if for any two nodes in the network, it is possible for, uh, say, a sending node, I, to prepare an arbitrary one qubit state, and for the receiving node, J, to make an arbitrary one qubit projective measurement in such a way that either the kind of delivery and measurement is done correctly, or the node concludes that the state was lost with some parameter P. So this is all very simple. Um, but if one had a network that does that, then one has, at least for sufficiently low values of this probability P, one is able to kind of implement various protocols that people already know. Okay, for example, like quantum key distribution. So I'm telling you this because um, uh, I'm interested in the question of how one can most efficiently test that I have attained a specific stage. Okay. So, of course, here in this one, it's very simple to sort of see what to do. One can stack all kinds of existing tests together, of course. You know, we're going to prepare some qubits, we're going to transmit them and try and maybe estimate the fidelity of reception or, or these kinds of things. So, but ideally, for all of these stages, it would be kind of cool if someone would come up with a test that says, if I run this test, then, in fact, I know that all the other protocols in this class can be implemented with some parameters, say probability p, that does not, is somewhat more accurate and than just stacking individual tests together, you know, like uh, estimating the fidelity of transmission, estimating loss probability, and all these kinds of things. Okay. So this becomes actually somewhat more interesting um, if you make entanglement, but before I do that, let me maybe mention actually that this stage does not imply the ability to transmit arbitrary qubits from I to J. So why this is so? So arbitrary qubits means that I have the ability to send an unknown qubit, one that I cannot prepare. And of course, if I lose the qubit, it is gone. Okay? Um, so this allows me to kind of, of course, transmit qubits, if I can repeat, maybe if it's lost, that I can prepare, like I have a classical description of that qubit, um, which of course is sufficient here, but it's not sufficient to send qubits. 
So the next one is, as you might have sort of expect, in the sense that we actually um, say that the nodes can generate, generate not just send qubits, but can generate at least two qubits, entangled qubits between them. And this entanglement generation, kind of to say that one can realize certain protocol, needs to be deterministic or generated in a heralded fashion. So heralded entanglement generation means that the kind of pairs are in fact generated deterministically, but now conditioned on a heralding event that is independent of whatever happens at the local nodes. Right. So for example, here one can then run device independent protocols. So somewhat more um, uh, involved is what we call sort of quantum memory networks. And this is maybe sort of the first stage that uh, uh, also demands some sort of non-trivial processing at the nodes. Namely that apart from you know, sending qubits and making entanglement, we now also ask that the end nodes can uh, use at least a one qubit ancilla um, and they can apply any gate to these qubits that um, you want. And they also have the ability to store qubits for some period of time, namely a time that is related in fact to the time that it takes classical information to travel between i and j. So note that this, of course, means that if my, the diameter of my network is larger, um, then I'm more demanding because I will demand a higher storage time. Um, but that's kind of what I care about here. Right? So we care about what applications can I run. And um, this, of course, means that if the nodes are further apart, I need a larger memory. So again, here, you know, this one is already a little bit more uh, complicated. If you think about how could I make a general, very efficient test to identify that, yes, I'm in that stage um, and I can execute various protocols. Okay. There's a few things known here, and I just mentioned the first one, which is technically not an application that someone might want to use the network for. But it's important that in this stage, in fact, one now also gains the ability to send unknown qubits, namely by teleportation. So there's of course some more advanced stages, you know, like uh, maybe I don't just have uh, some qubits that I can store, but here we've made no assumptions of how good the gates are in this quantum memory network. Maybe I want it to be fault tolerant or kind of computing networks. And there's more protocols here. Um, um, but again, and this is maybe also a challenge to you that I want to pose, is that people have kind of know all kinds of protocols for quantum networks, you know, they do all kinds of super fancy things. Um, but you know, it's not obvious that I require, for example, like, I don't know, fault tolerant qubits in order to really execute uh, protocol solving specific tasks. So a challenge to you is for these tasks solved by these protocols here, find a kind of protocol that actually own is, can be implemented in one of these lower stages um, than they presently are. All right. So I want to say a little bit about kind of uh, what the state of the art actually is. Probably you know this, but it's useful to understand that. Um, so currently the state is as follows. So entanglement has actually been distributed over decent distances, namely 1,203 kilometers, um, at a very low rate uh, from a satellite, in fact, in China. On the ground, like um, uh, people have communicated qubits over fiber, in fact, commercially to do QKD, over decently short distances. So the real challenge here, like in kind of realizing repeaters, and of course the end nodes, is to make these qubits travel over very long distances. Okay, so maybe I want to be precise because I uh, actually maybe not everybody clears. So a trusted repeater, of course, provides a solution for QKD, namely that I have someone in the middle, they exchange a key, trusted repeater exchanges a key with Bob. So here the distance is short enough, say 100 kilometers to make key. Here it's this short enough to make key. And of course, if we trust the guy in the middle, then Alice and Bob can communicate. So this does not always end well. So this is obviously sort of not what we want. Um, so we really want to send qubits over long distances. Okay. Great. So of course, there's kind of many questions one can ask here on kind of how to go beyond that. Um, and I want to actually, like I said, I want to motivate some problems and I want to show you a little bit maybe the scale of this problem by telling you a little bit about kind of what we are currently doing in, in Delft. Um, so we are quite serious about this quantum internet, as you may have discovered. And 
kind of these are the people that kind of work together in to make this happen. Like these are faculty at QTech. So Slava um, is an expert actually in device physics, specifically uh, solid state systems like NV and Diamond. Um, David works a lot on quantum information theory and also um, simulations. Ronald um, um, uh, works on NV and Diamond, specifically sort of linking them over distances. Um, Wolfgang Titel will actually join us in April. Um, so he also works on quantum repeaters. And maybe to understand some abstract constraints to think about, is that Ronald systems is very powerful, but it's relatively slow. So Ronald, for example, can distill entanglement. Wolfgang's is very fast, but you have very limited control. Okay. So we kind of want to use them together. Then Tim is working on actually improving the end nodes themselves. And I, well, I do a sort of general theory. Um, and I work with um, various of these people here. So, but to give you the scale of this problem, for example, we have uh, someone who works just on diamond implementation. We also work, uh, for example, with our colleagues in the computer science department. So Ari works on software engineering. And um, um, I'm very bad with this name. Polish people in the audience will completely hate me. Huh? Yeah, very good. <laughs> I, I always make an effort, but I'm always very scared that I do the wrong thing. Okay, anyway. Um, so he's great, so he works kind of on embedded systems, for example, um, and kind of we actually work together a lot on this sort of project. So, but to explain to you the scale of this, we actually have an engineering team, and this is our engineering project manager, Sander Kossen, um, to kind of make this happen. So maybe I want to say that there's many problems to be solved here, but maybe I can motivate you to solve kind of some of them. Okay? We have many students on both sides. So let me actually, on the abstract level, actually tell you sort of a little bit what the state of the art is with respect to kind of the end nodes. And I will make this sort of specific to, to diamonds. So you can think that the stuff that we are currently using, um, actually we have more qubits locally, but the network that I will show you shortly um, has local nodes consisting of six qubits with roughly one second storage time. And entangling rates are not particularly high. Okay. So this is the rate at which you can produce entanglement between adjacent nodes. There's various other efforts, of course, around the world in order to kind of make that happen, but it's maybe useful to have some number um, to give you some idea of what's possible. Okay. So this is what they look like. Um, I will not kind of talk about them, but you can ask me later. Um, but maybe there's one important thing to understand, again, on a purely abstract level, if you think about protocol design, um, it is actually useful to understand one abstract feature about uh, how entanglement is generated, at least in our system, between these two diamonds. Namely, it's generated by a heralded uh, emission, so there's like an emission from each of these um, nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond, like a photon travels to the middle. Um, um, uh, there's basically, if, I guess in quantum information language, you can think uh, as a Bell measurement. Um, um, one cannot discriminate all Bell states, but one can discriminate some of them. So there's a probabilistic entanglement generation between these two nodes. So the upshot that I think the only thing you should remember about them is A, it's probabilistic, and B, it takes a certain time for this <coughs> signal to propagate back to the individual nodes that says, yes, I have succeeded, or no, I have failed. Right. I think otherwise it's not important to understand exactly how this works. Right. <coughs> So I wanted to tell you a little bit about, like I said, um, these efforts, because maybe you're motivated to um, solve some of our problems. Um, so in 2020, in fact, we are aiming to put up a little test network outside. The Netherlands is a very small country, but I think it will be quite beautiful. So these, in fact, will be quantum processors of uh, six qubits each, okay? And we will kind of link them. And especially we will be able to produce entanglement between not directly adjacent nodes in this network. Um, our ob objective is to actually find a scalable design, and I will talk a little bit more about this in a second. Um, but maybe to say a little bit more about this network, our objective is also to make this network universally programmable. So this is a much more theoretical problem, and I'm very happy to discuss this at length with anyone here. Um, so the objective is that you will be able to run any of your favorite applications on this uh, quantum internet demo that we will put here, uh, which will be a quantum memory network. <laughs> um, so a certain class of applications can be supported here, and um, we want to make this in such a way that one can just basically program it to do anything you want. Okay. Right. Like I said, when, I, when you invited me for this talk, I um, said that maybe I should also interest you with some very beautiful mathematical problems, um, given that we're here at uh, IHP. And I want to take a little detour now. Um, to a problem that is actually sort of very nice. It's motivated by some of these investigations in quantum internet. It may not be absolutely necessary in order to achieve it, um, but I think it's a very nice problem, and I hope that maybe you're also interested in it. Okay. 
So the problem is the following, and I will tell you a little bit more shortly about the motivation for this problem. Um, so let's consider a graph state, and uh, maybe for those of you who don't know what a graph state is, let me kind of um, explain very briefly. So let's consider a number of qubits in this example, namely seven, and it's a graph, and whenever there's an edge in the graph, um, it has a consequence to kind of uh, um, uh, sort of stabilizer generators that are being implied by this graph connectivity. So specifically, for every node in this graph state, um, one can identify one element in this set of stabilizers um, where one has an X at the node and whenever there's an edge, so for example connecting 1 and 4, I'm going to put Z here. And if there's no edge, I'm going to put identity. So I've done this here for three nodes, but of course I could do this for the entire graph. So some of you sort of favorite states um, um, are graph states. For example, a GZ state is a graph state. Um, and a GZ state actually uh, can be uh, expressed as a graph in the following way. So let me consider the GZ state between, in this case, 1, 3, 4, and 5. So it corresponds to the red graph that I drew here. Okay. So actually a graph state, I guess for the expert here, it's sort of clear, but um, a graph state, in fact, and can be written in terms of several equivalent graphs. So in fact, the GHZ state can not just be written as a star graph, so star here meaning, you know, four is the center of the star, and like one, three, and five are surrounding it. But the GHZ state equivalently can also be expressed as the fully connected graph on these nodes. And well, um, uh, uh, um, one can kind of go from one to the other by applying what is called the local complementation. So one can kind of locally apply a Clifford gate that then, of course, changes the set of stabilizers and therefore changing the kind of graph structure. Okay. So one might ask, and it's kind of nice, um, one might now ask the following question. Um, is it given a specific graph state and, say, a specific set of nodes, say one, three, four, and five, um, and a specific target state, namely in this case, say, the GZ state between 1, 3, 4, and 5, is it possible that given the initial graph, there exists a sequence of local complementations like Clifford gates, um, Pauli measurements, and potentially classical communication, that transforms, say, graph number 1 in the, desired, in the kind of desired form of graph number 2 on a subset of these nodes? So people have investigated actually algorithms, so they've kind of uh, used some classical tricks from classical computer science um, to answer the question sort of whether one graph can be produced from another. Um, but this is not quite the question that I'm asking here, because I'm asking about only a subset of the nodes, and I want to have a very specific target state. So you might ask why might I ask this question? So um, it is of course somewhat nice if you had a setting where you have large graph states, um, in order to make very fast decisions. You can say, you know, if I want to g realize a GZ state on a subset of the nodes, say in my quantum computer, um, can I very quickly uh, decide which nodes to measure in which, say, Pauli basis, um, uh, on which sort of local gates to perform in order to realize the state that I want. Another reason why this is somewhat interesting is that people have, for example, investigated repeater schemes uh, based on cluster states, which are actually quite challenging and maybe somewhat further away. But nevertheless, one can use such algorithm as a sort of design help uh, in order to quickly figure out whether something might work or not. Okay. So we've investigated this problem. And uh, um, uh, so here, maybe again, a slightly more formal uh, formulation of this problem. So the question is, given some graph on some set of vertices V, does there exist a sequence of local complementation and local Pauli's and classical communication such that I can get the graph that I want, here G prime, on a subset of the vertices called U and some junk. Okay, I don't care about the junk. So there's an equivalent problem actually, um, namely this problem is equivalent to asking whether this G prime is a vertex minor of G. Um, uh, and the objective is now to kind of find an algorithm that answers this question, like is it possible, yes and no, and also outputs in fact the sequence of local complementations and measurements that I have to perform in order to make that happen. So why is this sort of tricky? And I'm giving you here sort of an example that local complementations, so say a gate on qubit 2, can change the graph. 
here. <laughs> like if we go from here to there, um, long term mutation on two, kind of create some extra edges here, which have obviously sort of changed the graph. So it's implied by some previous work in classical computer science um, that um, this general question, in fact, is fixed parameter tractable uh, in terms of what's called the rank width of G. Um, so let me maybe explain a little bit what this is. Um, so a lot of problems, of course, are difficult, um, maybe for the physicists here. Um, I know that you mm, basically hear the computer scientists all the time talk about you know, things being NP-complete <laughs> or very hard. Um, but very few problems are actually hard on uh, sort of very interesting instances of the problem in the sense that on, say, problems that have a lot of structure. So many problems in the real world have a lot of structure uh, and this basically means that they admit a simpler description than the entirety of the graph. So the rank width is actually quite complicated to understand. I'm happy to explain you in the break. But there's a related measure called the tree width, which is a little bit easier to understand. And the tree width effectively measures how far my graph is away from being a tree. Okay. So it's like a number that kind of measures, say, the distance of my graph from a tree. And in fact, uh, many problems are fixed parameter tractable on graphs which have uh, low tree width, which basically means one can solve them in polynomial time up to a free prefactor that, roughly speaking, is like 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 2, where this tower of 2s scales with the tree width of this graph. Okay. So obviously, like if the tree width is very large, this is kind of not very good. <laughs> um, um, <coughs> but yeah, anyway. So there's also this concept called rank width, which actually can be much smaller than the tree width. And uh, one can use these general ideas to um, solve this. Okay. We actually prove. Um, I'm not aware this has been proved before, but one can also show that this problem, in fact, is NP-complete even if I ask for only a very specific output state, like, for example, the GZ state. So there's some things known about that, maybe just to let you know. So uh, if the number of if n is very small, um, so here, kind of the <coughs> output, then this is possible if and only if the vertices are connected. Um, it's not so difficult to see that it's also the case for n equals 3, but it is actually difficult to decide this if the kind of um, um, nodes are larger. Okay. So I don't have time to really explain to you kind of exactly how this works, but maybe I want to just advertise this <coughs> in the sense that we have an algorithm actually. Of course, you know, there's these classical techniques in fixed parameter um, world, like from Corsell, that one can just throw at this problem and out comes a algorithm. In fact, not just for producing the GHZ state. But one can, in fact, find a very sort of beautiful, nice algorithm for the GHZ state. Um, that has the following complexity. So this is the number of um, uh, qubits in the GZ state, and this is the number of initial vertices. And it works if the graph is what's called distance hereditary, so or it has rank width 1. So for the non-graph experts, so distance hereditary means that if I remove a vertex, then the distances remain unchanged, okay. roughly. So this here, this Sn, is like, um, say, the star graph. And so I want to make the star graph, and I will not explain to you how our algorithm works, but I want to explain to you some challenges in this algorithm, or the rough idea. So let's say that I want to produce the star graph on these vertices here, including this one, where this one is sort of maybe very far away. So the first thing we do is apply a sequence of local complementations to actually connect this one to here. And this is possible. Um, this is a serious lemma. For example, we proved that this does never disconnect the graph and these kind of things. But the first thing is to basically connect them, so kind of bring them close. But this sort of may, as you've seen from this previous example, create some edges that we don't want. So here, say we've made some edges, the dotted ones, which we don't kind of want to see. So basically the second step of our algorithm is then to sort of remove these unwanted edges. And in order to do that, one can use a nice feature of these distance hereditary graphs, namely that they are, have a, admit a very simple uh, description. Um, in fact, one, this is in this description can be derived from the fact that one can build any distance hereditary graph um, by twinning and adding leaves. So what does this mean? So let's say that I start with two nodes. I can add a leaf, basically like a dangling vertex somewhere, or I can take a vertex and split it in two, including uh, duplicating all the existing edges. Okay, so this is twinning. Um, so if a graph has this property, then in fact it can be constructed from, like from the beginning from, by making these two moves. And this also means that this now gives an idea for an algorithm, how to get fixed the problem, so to say, by basically sort of doing twin and leaf reductions and getting rid of all of them um, to then finally arrive at the final case. <coughs> so 
So there's some kind of details here, but um, they can be addressed. Right. So this is somewhat quantum. <coughs> so I hope I made everyone very happy um, um, about by talking about this actually very beautiful problem. Okay. So in the remainder of my talk, and I don't have so much time left, um, I now want to um, raise some questions which are not yet so well defined as this graph problem. You know, the graph problem is very well defined. Like I want to, I am asking, can this graph number one be transformed to graph number two under a certain sequence of operations? Um, so in realizing, uh, like, uh, sort of if one thinks about sort of how can we make a quantum internet, um, one uh, quickly realizes that this problem is extremely challenging and complicated and involves very many different aspects. And I think that kind of many of these aspects, even though we may sort of heuristically explore them right now, um, would deserve a very nice formulation and kind of um, work to really understand them in depth. Okay. Um, and I want to start with a question of what is actually a good model. And um, um, I want to uh, start this with an example, in fact. Uh, so let's consider the following thing. So let's consider a question about entanglement distillation. Let's say they have two nodes. Let's call them A and B. And entanglement distillation, what it does is, well, I start with two sort of somewhat entangled qubits, and I produce one more kind of highly entangled qubit pair out of it. And this can be done, like Ronald has done it in the lab, um, which is very nice. Okay. Now, the question is, of course, sometimes you might ask yourself a question, like a very simple one. For example, is it if I have like two of these, so say I have A, I have a node in the middle, let me call it the repeater, and I have a node on the, say, far end, say B, is it better if I wanted to generate entanglement between the say, left node and the rightmost nodes, is it better if I first perform entanglement swapping, so essentially teleporting this qubit to the end, or is it better to first distill? So like distilling first would mean I make better pairs out of this, probabilistically, and then I swap to make the entire line. Or might it be better to first um, swap and I have crappy entanglement, and then I can distill. Okay. So of course one can now throw all kinds of models at this, um, which sort of, of course relates to the question of where do these entanglement, where does the entanglement come from? Is it already there and has some kind of error model? Or is it a model where maybe I ask this question where in every time step with some probability P such an edge is created? Of course, you know, we might try and make this model ever more accurate. We might say, you know, maybe I don't know P, but there's some distribution, and I'm going to make some worst case estimate that I don't pick the smallest P. Okay. I might put some kind of noise model on these kind of nodes. Um, and, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, because this obviously matters, you know, how long do I have to store it, and what, what is the fidelity of these operations now? Um, and one might ask, so to say, you know, if I want to analyze such behavior in a large network, what is really a good model? I can, of course, this sort of instance, you know, I can always maybe write down the entire situation <laughs> and try and study it. And people have also studied questions like, you know, let me just assume that certain edges are pro uh, present with probability P, because it's very nice, you know, we can maybe apply some percolation theory to understand what happens in the entirety of the entanglement graph and all these very beautiful things. So these things, of course, are extremely important and valuable to sort of stake off the area a bit and understand sort of basic limitations also of when entanglement might be produced or maybe not be produced. But the question is a little bit, are they a very accurate model if I really want to understand whether something can be done or not? Okay. And maybe the not surprising answer is that, of course, it's not quite so simple. And already in this example, one can find sort of <laughs> models <laughs> that predict that, well, in some regimes it's better to swap, in some regimes it's better to steal. So um, I guess currently we are still searching for certain good models, but in order to do this, we've done something which uh, um, may be somewhat unusual. We have decided to simulate this. Um, so we have, in fact, built a simulation platform called NetSquid, which stands for Network Simulator of Quantum Information Using Discrete Events. <coughs> and basically what it does is one can, we also have a separate algorithm actually to do some crude identification. And then one can use NetSquid to verify various possibilities. And I'll explain to you a little bit how um, NetSquid actually works. Okay. 
So this simulation platform, in fact, is designed to model timing delays in the network. And maybe I don't need to be super specific about this, but I just want to note that these are actually ideas one can take sort of from classical network um, analysis. So there's also packages that simulate classical networks. And in particular, what a discrete event simulation does is that it allows you to study the effect of timing delays or behavior in the network. It's very complicated to understand that of, uh, in general. In my, of course, trivial example, where I just have two, one can you know, ad hoc do all kinds of calculations. But it becomes very difficult to understand the effect of um, timing delays, and in particular also the effect that events can take some non-deterministic time, there's some distribution, um, over the behavior of the entire network. So we've built this thing, like um, uh, I just want to advertise it. So for one can, in fact, uh, it's like Lego. Um, you know, you can uh, produce a source here. In fact, it's a very simple snippet to make entanglement. It's not how we produce entanglement, but um, you can make any entangling node snippet you want. Um, where basically there's an event, you can emit qubits, you can store one of them, you can send one of them over the fiber and you can store them. And you can identify and put any model you want on any of these kind of objects, like you can have different fiber, different queues, or I don't know what you want. And of course, in some point, this entangle node will generate events saying, ha, entanglement has been made. Okay. So one can use this, in fact, to study this question, like repeater schemes, much more in depth. Uh, in, like I said, NetSquid is a little bit like Lego, so once we've made these sort of Lego blocks, one can sort of easily stack them together, in fact, to uh, simulate things in the network. So NetSquid actually supports two simulation modes. It can simulate full quantum dynamics, or it can do graph state or Clifford-based dynamics, which allows us to, at least for simple models, investigate very large networks. So this is kind of what it looks like, like I said. Um, and in fact, one can then, for some realistic models, <laughs> at least in our situation, come to the conclusion that one should always distill first. Which is not so surprising, actually, if you think about it. <laughs> but uh, um, <coughs> uh, yeah, like I said, it's very hard to sort of justify sort of sim certain simplifications in the model. Maybe at some point we can do that. Um <coughs> but one of the motivations is to actually sort of discover such simplifications. So there's another reason actually why we made this platform is because um, we were very keen, like I said, um, to actually scale this network to a very large number of nodes. And in order to do that, we wanted to answer the question, um, what is, uh, where in fact do I have to put these repeaters? Because I cannot put them everywhere. Um, it's nice to study them on a line or on a grid, but I'm afraid to say that they can never be on a line or a grid. Um, <coughs> and. Um, uh, in particular, we want to then also understand the precise uh, effect of certain parameters. Because, you know, there's very many parameters that one can optimize, or Ronald can optimize, or Wolfgang can optimize. And actually, on a large network, it's not so obvious anymore which ones are the most relevant ones. We also use this simulator, in fact, we've now done this, um, to uh, investigate, um, say, the control of this network. And this is the last thing that I just want to mention today. I don't really want to talk about it in detail, because I've run out of time. But I want to motivate you to talk to me, and then I will tell you all about it afterwards. Okay. Okay. So maybe the message here is that it's currently it's not so clear what a good model is. Okay. Right. So what is a network control? So maybe I can actually ask the question, who here knows how messages are actually sent over the classical internet? You know, if, if I write a protocol that says, A, Alice sends, I don't know, X to Bob, what happens? No one. <laughs> um, I encourage you to learn about this um, because it's, non, it's highly non-trivial. <laughs> it's a highly non-trivial problem of how actually Alice can send X to Bob. Okay, many things need to happen. Um, so Alice can send X to Bob in such a reliable and beautiful manner that and we can, many Alices can send many uh, Xs to Bob at the same time as we're all used to. And part of this is that um, classical kind of internet people have identified various layers of abstractions, and you should actually know the, love these abstractions, because after you've defined them, you also never need to talk to experiment again, for example. Um, so the idea of these kind of abstractions is to um, encapsulate certain behaviors so that kind of uh, you can solve the problem using the abstraction as like a building block. So you don't want to know anymore exactly, for example, how this entanglement is produced in, in, in the experiment. You only want to know that there's a certain functionality, like I can say, you know, I have a box that say entanglement generation, I say create. <coughs> but it's important to think about what this box actually should do 
I mean, not just on the experimental level, of course, but the important part to think, I think, is about what information is this box giving you about the entanglement that has been generated? What if I ask for two entangled pairs, for example, at the same time, the first generation fails, the second one succeeds, how do I know which one is which on both sides without having to talk back and forth all the time? Okay. So the objective is basically to think about how can I kind of track this entanglement in a network without having to kind of well, I actually don't want to ever talk to anyone <laughs> unless it's absolutely necessary in order to sort of, uh, kind of agree upon which kind of um, um, yeah, entangled qubits I'm using in my simple example. Yeah. Okay. So I can give you some examples in the break if you want, um, why this is a very interesting problem. Okay. So we have actually thought about this problem a lot and we have come up with a entanglement generation uh, protocol and also an entanglement tracking protocol, which is like, a, I guess, a computer science um, protocol, in fact. There's essentially no more physics involved in this. Um, but it then allows us to do much more sort of abstract things like routing and entanglement management, because now we also know what information is available where at one point in the network. So these things are actually quite important. If you want to make like a large scale quantum internet, um, you need to think about how, who needs to talk to whom, and you want to minimize the kind of communication delays and the rounds of communication that are necessary in order to execute certain actions. This problem is easy if I remember that, uh, if I imagine that repeaters are on the line and, you know, I only ever want to send information down that line. Um, but frankly, this would be a very boring quantum internet. <laughs> I can only ever send information, I don't know, from one person to the other. Um, but of course, we want to talk to kind of allow many people to, to be able to use that. Okay. Right. So talk to me in the break when you want to know about this. So essentially, um, you have some kind of network stack. If you want to know about this, we actually implement this in some kind of little control system, which is also minorly adventurous. But it's so there's many challenges in kind of realizing this. Um, I think these are maybe the most interesting to you. Yes. That's a joint breakfast breaking in uh, room F005. Um, so of course, these are very important. You know, I want to use fewer qubits to achieve certain tasks. I want protocols to be robust. I want to find new protocols. I want to find tests for these stages and all of these things. Um, but um, also sort of experiment wants to solve all of these kind of very important problems. Um, but in fact, there's a lot of sort of classical problems um, that uh, appear here. And uh, I'm happy to tell you more about them in the break. So if you want to join us, um, oops, then there's various options um, depending on where you are. And um, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much, Stephanie. Any questions for Stephanie? Yes. I have a question. So the last slide you mentioned switches. So uh, do you know if you, you know, the entanglement carrying signals, the switches that you have now in optical fibers, would they be good enough or they are not, co they don't preserve the coherence? Uh, so, like, I'm not aware that any of them preserve the coherence. From yeah, the so there are, so you need switches that work at that. Yeah. Yeah, there are actually such things, for example, Chung Sam Kim at uh, Duke has built such things for the uh, for this ion trap uh, quantum computer. Okay. Um, but yeah. So they're under but development. But the classic, you cannot just use the classical ones, yeah. So, maybe to continue the question, so, do you think that we will need a new infrastructure? of like uh, optical fibers and things, or what we already have can be used for, uh, for things like that? Yeah, so it's funny that you guys ask this question about the infrastructure, it's a foreign question. Um, so like, uh, um, so it's in, like, I think it's useful to use the existing infrastructure. Uh, in particular, this also means that uh, we'll need to go to telecom wavelengths, um, which we can actually do. So the objective is to, of course, use the existing fibers if they're there. Um, Wolfgang actually also has some efforts <coughs> to sort of multiplex classical in quantum signals on the same fiber. Um, but yeah. All right, so if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank Stephanie. And this is the end of the day, and uh, the cocktail is tonight. Okay, so let's thank Stephanie again and all the speakers of today. Thank you.